Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Yes, a eh? Big Easy Blasphemy. Luca, Susan, Patty, Samantha, and Mary. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. And because you joined in the month of May, you and everyone else who supports us through Patreon or by a one-time tip via buymeacoffee.com, will be entered into a raffle at the end of the month, the prize for which is our first-ever offer of exclusive merch. That's right, it's Swag Month. If you're interested in learning more about that, and learning more about the perks available to subscribers, you'll find links to both Patreon and buymeacoffee.com in the show description. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out, and thank you to everyone who supported us so far. We can't do it without you. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight we're continuing with a work that I haven't read from in some while, but which I really love. A Short History of the World by H.G. Wells. First published in 1922 by the Macmillan and Company, New York. Let's pick up right where we left off in Chapter 20. The Last Babylonian Empire and the Empire of Darius I. Let's begin. We have already mentioned how Assyria became a great military power under Tiglath Pileser III and under the usurper Sargon II. Sargon was not this man's original name. He adopted it to flatter the conquered Babylonians by reminding them of that ancient founder of the Akkadian Empire, Sargon I, 2,000 years before his time. Babylon, for all that it was a conquered city, was of greater population and importance than Nineveh, and its great god Bel Marduk and its traders and priests had to be treated politely. In Mesopotamia in the 8th century BC, we are already far beyond the barbaric days, when the capture of a town meant loot and massacre. Conquerors sought to propitiate and win the conquered. For a century and a half after Sargon, the new Assyrian Empire endured, and as we have noted, Asurbanipal, or Sardanapalus, held at least Lower Egypt. But the power and solidarity of Assyria waned rapidly. Egypt, by an effort, threw off the foreigner, under a pharaoh, Samatikus I, and under Necho II, attempted a war of conquest in Syria. By that time, Assyria was grappling with foes nearer at hand and could make but a poor resistance. A Semitic people from southeast Mesopotamia, the Chaldeans, combined with Aryan Medes and Persians from the northeast against Nineveh. And in 606 BC, for now we are coming down to exact chronology, took that city. There was a division of the spoils of Assyria. A Median Empire was set up in the north under Syazeres. 
It included Nineveh, and its capital was Ecbatana. Eastward it reached to the borders of India. To the south of this, in a great crescent, was a new Chaldean Empire, the Second Babylonian Empire, which rose to a very great degree of wealth and power under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar the Great, the Nebuchadnezzar of the Bible. The last great days, the greatest days of all for Babylon, began. For a time, the two empires remained at peace, and the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar was married to Sayazaris. Meanwhile, Necho II was pursuing his easy conquests in Syria. He had defeated and slain King Josiah of Judah, a small country of which there is more to tell presently, at the Battle of Megiddo in 608 BC and he pushed on to the Euphrates to encounter not a decadent Assyria, but a renascent Babylonia. The Chaldeans dealt very vigorously with the Egyptians. Necho was routed and driven back to Egypt, and the Babylonian frontier pushed down to the ancient Egyptian boundaries. From 606 until 589 B.C., the Second Babylonian Empire flourished insecurely. It flourished so long as it kept the peace with the stronger, hardier Median Empire to the north, and during these sixty-seven years, not only life but learning flourished in the ancient city. Even under the Assyrian monarchs, and especially under Sardanapalus, Babylon had been a scene of great intellectual activity. Sardanapalus, though an Assyrian, had been quite Babylonized. He made a library, a library not of paper, but of the clay tablets that were used for writing in Mesopotamia since early Sumerian days. His collection has been unearthed, and is perhaps the most precious store of historical material in the world. The last of the Chaldean line of Babylonian monarchs, Nabonidus, had even keener literary tastes. He patronized antiquarian researches, and when a date was worked out by his investigators for the accession of Sargon I, he commemorated the fact by inscriptions. But there were many signs of disunion in his empire, and he sought to centralize it by bringing a number of the various local gods to Babylon and setting up temples to them there. This device was to be practiced quite successfully by the Romans in later times, but in Babylon it roused the jealousy of the powerful priesthood of Belmarduk the dominant god of the Babylonians. They cast about for a possible alternative to Nabonidus, and found it in Cyrus the Persian, the ruler of the adjacent Median Empire. Cyrus had already distinguished himself by conquering Croesus, the rich king of Lydia in eastern Asia Minor. He came up against Babylon. There was a battle outside the walls, and the gates of the city were open to him in 538 BC. His soldiers entered the city without fighting. The crown prince Belshazzar, the son of Nabonidus, was feasting, the Bible relates, when a hand appeared and wrote in letters of fire upon the wall, these mystical words, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharshan, which was interpreted by the prophet Daniel, whom he summoned to read the riddle, as, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting, and thy kingdom is given to the Medes and Persians. 
Possibly the priests of Belmarduk knew something about that writing on the wall. Belshazzar was killed that night, says the Bible. Nabonidus was taken prisoner, and the occupation of the city was so peaceful that the services of Belmarduk continued without intermission. Thus it was, the Babylonian and Median empires were united. Cambyses, the son of Cyrus, subjugated Egypt. Cambyses went mad and was accidentally killed, and was presently succeeded by Darius the Mede, Darius I, the son of Histaspes, one of the chief counselors of Cyrus. The Persian Empire of Darius I, the first of the new Aryan empires in the seat of the old civilizations, was the greatest empire the world had hitherto seen. It included all Asia Minor and Syria, all the old Assyrian and Babylonian empires, Egypt, the Caucasus and Caspian regions, Media, Persia, and it extended into India as far as the Indus. Such an empire was possible because the horse and rider and the chariot and the man-made road had now been brought into the world. Hitherto, the ass and ox and the camel for desert use had afforded the swiftest method of transport. Great arterial roads were made by the Persian rulers to hold their new empire, and post horses were always in waiting for the imperial messenger or the traveler with an official permit. Moreover, the world was now beginning to use coined money, which greatly facilitated trade and intercourse. But the capital of this vast empire was no longer Babylon. In the long run, the priesthood of Belmarduk gained nothing by their treason. Babylon, though still important, was now a declining city, and the great cities of the new empire were Persepolis and Susa and Ecbatana. The capital was Susa. Nineveh was already abandoned and sinking into ruin. Chapter 21 The Early History of the Jews And now we can tell of the Hebrews, a Semitic people, not so important in their own time as in their influence upon the later history of the world. They were settled in Judea long before 1000 BC, and their capital city after that time was Jerusalem. Their story is interwoven with that of the great empires on either side of them, Egypt to the south, and the changing empires of Syria, Assyria, and Babylon to the north. Their country was an inevitable high road between these latter powers and Egypt. Their importance in the world is due to the fact that they produced a written literature, a world history, a collection of laws, chronicles, psalms, books of wisdom, poetry and fiction, and political utterances which became at last what Christians know as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. This literature appears in history in the 4th or 5th century BC. Probably this literature was first put together in Babylon. We have already told how the pharaoh, Necho II, invaded the Assyrian Empire while Assyria was fighting for life against Medes, Persians, and Chaldeans. Josiah, king of Judah, opposed him and was defeated and slain at Megiddo in 608 BC. Judah became a tributary to Egypt, and when Nebuchadnezzar the Great, 
the new Chaldean king in Babylon rolled back Necho into Egypt. He attempted to manage Judah by setting up puppet kings in Jerusalem. The experiment failed. The people massacred his Babylonian officials, and he then determined to break up this little state altogether, which had long been playing off Egypt against the northern empire. Jerusalem was sacked and burned, and the remnant of the people was carried off captive to Babylon. There they remained until Cyrus took Babylon in 538 BC. He then collected them together and sent them back to resettle their country and rebuild the walls and temple of Jerusalem. Before that time, the Jews do not seem to have been a very civilized or united people. Probably only a very few of them could read or write. In their own history, one never hears of the early books of the Bible being read. The first mention of a book is in the time of Josiah. The Babylonian captivity civilized them and consolidated them. They returned aware of their own literature an acutely self-conscious and political people. Their Bible at that time seems to have consisted only of the Pentateuch, that is to say, the first five books of the Old Testament as we know it. In addition, as separate books, they already had many of the other books that have since been incorporated with the Pentateuch into the present Hebrew Bible. Chronicles, the Psalms, and Proverbs, for example. The accounts of the creation of the world, of Adam and Eve, and of the flood, with which the Bible begins, run closely parallel with similar Babylonian legends. They seem to have been part of the common beliefs of all the Semitic peoples. So, too, the stories of Moses and of Samson have Sumerian and Babylonian parallels. But with the story of Abraham and onward begins something more special to the Jewish race. Abraham may have lived as early as the days of Hammurabi in Babylon. He was a patriarchal Semitic nomad. To the book of Genesis the reader must go for the story of his wanderings and for the stories of his sons and grandchildren, and how they became captive in the land of Egypt. He traveled through Canaan, and the God of Abraham, says the Bible story, promised this smiling land of prosperous cities to him and to his children. And after a long sojourn in Egypt, and after fifty years of wandering in the wilderness under the leadership of Moses, the children of Abraham, grown now to a host of twelve tribes, invaded the land of Canaan from the Arabian desert to the east. They may have done this somewhere between 1600 and 1300 BC. There are no Egyptian records of Moses, nor of Canaan at this time, to help out the story but at any rate they did not succeed in conquering any more than the hilly backgrounds of the promised land. The coast was now in the hands not of the Canaanites, but of newcomers, those Aegean peoples, the Philistines, and their cities, Gaza, Goth, Ashdod, Ascalon, and Joppa, successfully withstood the Hebrew attack. For many generations, the children of Abraham remained an obscure people of the hilly back country, engaged in incessant bickerings with the Philistines and with the kindred tribes around them, the Moabites, the Midianites, and so forth. The reader will find in the book of Judges a record of their struggles and disasters during this period. 
for very largely it is a record of disasters and failures, frankly told. For most of this period, the Hebrews were ruled, so far as there was any rule among them, by priestly judges selected by the elders of the people. But at last, somewhere towards 1000 BC, they chose themselves a king, Saul, to lead them in battle. But Saul's leading was no great improvement upon the leading of the judges. He perished under the hail of Philistine arrows at the Battle of Mount Gilboa. His armor went into the temple of the Philistine Venus, and his body was nailed to the walls of Bethshan. His successor, David, was more successful and more politic. With David dawned the only period of prosperity the Hebrew peoples were ever to know. It was based on a close alliance with the Phoenician city of Tyre, whose king Hiram seems to have been a man of very great intelligence and enterprise. He wished to secure a trade route to the Red Sea through the Hebrew hill country. Normally, Phoenician trade went to the Red Sea by Egypt, but Egypt was in a state of profound disorder at this time. There may have been other obstructions to Phoenician trade along this line. And at any rate, Hiram established the very closest relations, both with David and with his son and successor Solomon. Under Hiram's auspices, the walls, palace, and temple of Jerusalem arose, and in return, Hiram built and launched his ships on the Red Sea. A very considerable trade passed northward and southward through Jerusalem, and Solomon achieved a prosperity and magnificence unprecedented in the experience of his people. He was even given a daughter of Pharaoh in marriage. But it is well to keep the proportion of things in mind. At the climax of his glories, Solomon was only a little subordinate king in a little city. His power was so transitory that within a few years of his death, Shishak, the first pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty, had taken Jerusalem and looted most of its splendors. The account of Solomon's magnificence, given in the books of Kings and Chronicles, is questioned by many critics. They say that it was added to and exaggerated by the patriotic pride of later writers, but the Bible account read carefully is not so overwhelming as it appears at the first reading. Solomon's temple, if one works out the measurements, would go inside a small suburban church, and his 1400 chariots ceased to impress us when we learn from an Assyrian monument that his successor Ahab sent a contingent of 2000 to the Assyrian army. It is also plainly manifest from the Bible narrative that Solomon spent himself in display and overtaxed and overworked his people. At his death, the northern part of his kingdom broke off from Jerusalem and became the independent kingdom of Israel. Jerusalem remained the capital city of Judah. The prosperity of the Hebrew people was short-lived. Hiram died, and the help of Tyre ceased to strengthen Jerusalem. Egypt grew strong again. The history of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah becomes a history of two little states, ground between first Syria, then Assyria, and then Babylon to the north and Egypt to the south. It is a tale of disasters and of deliverances that only delayed disaster. In 721 BC, 
the kingdom of Israel was swept away into captivity by the Assyrians, and its people utterly lost to history. Judah struggled on until, in 1604 BC, as we have told, it shared the fate of Israel. There may be details open to criticism in the Bible story of Hebrew history from the days of the judges onward, but on the whole it is evidently a true story which squares with all that has been learnt in the excavations of Egypt and Assyria and Babylon during the past century. It was in Babylon that the Hebrew people got their history together and evolved their tradition. The people who came back to Jerusalem at the command of Cyrus were a very different people in spirit and knowledge from those who had gone into captivity. They had learnt civilization. In the development of their peculiar character, a very great part was played by certain men, a new sort of men, the prophets, to whom we must now direct our attention. These prophets mark the appearance of new and remarkable forces in the steady development of human society. Chapter 22 Priests and Prophets in Judea The fall of Assyria and Babylon were only the first of a series of disasters that were to happen to the Semitic peoples. In the 7th century BC, it would have seemed as though the whole civilized world was to be dominated by Semitic rulers. They ruled the great Assyrian Empire, and they had conquered Egypt. Assyria, Babylon, Syria were all Semitic, speaking languages that were mutually intelligible. The trade of the world was in Semitic hands. Tyre, Sidon, the great mother cities of the Phoenician coast, had thrown out colonies that grew at last to even greater proportion in Spain, Sicily, and Africa. Carthage, founded before 800 BC, had risen to a population of more than a million. It was, for a time, the greatest city on earth. Its ships went to Britain and out into the Atlantic. They may have reached Madeira. We have already noted how Hiram cooperated with Solomon to build ships on the Red Sea for the Arabian and perhaps for the Indian trade. In the time of the pharaoh Necho, a Phoenician expedition sailed completely round Africa. At that time, the Aryan peoples were still barbarians. Only the Greeks were reconstructing a new civilization of the ruins of the one they had destroyed, and the Medes were becoming formidable, as an Assyrian inscription calls them, in Central Asia. In 800 BC, no one could have prophesied that before the 3rd century BC, every trace of Semitic dominion would be wiped out by Aryan-speaking conquerors, and that everywhere the Semitic peoples would be subjects or tributaries, or scattered altogether. Now of all these civilized Semites who were beaten and overrun, in these five eventful centuries, one people only held together and clung to its ancient traditions, and that was this little people, the Jews, who were sent back to build their city of Jerusalem by Cyrus the Persian. And they were able to do this because they had got together this literature of theirs, their Bible in Babylon. It is not so much the Jews who made the Bible as the Bible which made the Jews. Running through this Bible were certain ideas, different from the ideas of the people about them, 
very stimulating and sustaining ideas, to which they were destined to cling through five and twenty centuries of hardship, adventure, and oppression. Foremost of these Jewish ideas was this, that their God was invisible and remote, an invisible God in a temple not made with hands, a Lord of righteousness throughout the earth. All other peoples had national gods, embodied in images that lived in temples. If the image was smashed and the temple raised, presently that god died out. But this was a new idea, this god of the Jews. In the heavens, high above priests and sacrifices. And this God of Abraham, the Jews believed, had chosen them to be his peculiar people, to restore Jerusalem and make it the capital of righteousness in the world. They were a people exalted by their sense of common destiny. This belief saturated them all when they returned to Jerusalem after the captivity in Babylon. Is it any miracle that in their days of overthrow and subjugation, many Babylonians and Syrians and so forth, and later on many Phoenicians, speaking practically the same language and having endless customs, habits, tastes, and traditions in common should be attracted by this inspiring cult and should seek to share in its fellowship and its promise. After the fall of Tyre, Sidon, Carthage, and the Spanish Phoenician cities, the Phoenicians suddenly vanish from history. And as suddenly we find, not simply in Jerusalem, but in Spain, Africa, Egypt, Arabia, the East, wherever the Phoenicians had set their feet, communities of Jews, and they were all held together by the Bible and by the reading of the Bible. Jerusalem was, from the first, only their nominal capital. Their real city was this book of books. This is a new sort of thing in history. It is something of which the seeds were sown long before, when the Sumerians and Egyptians began to turn their hieroglyphics into writing. The Jews were a new thing, a people without a king, and presently without a temple. For as we shall tell, Jerusalem itself was broken up in 70 AD held together and consolidated out of heterogeneous elements by nothing but the power of the written word. And this mental welding of the Jews was neither planned nor foreseen, nor done by either priests or statesmen. Not only a new kind of community, but a new kind of man comes into history with the development of the Jews. In the days of Solomon, the Hebrews looked like becoming a little people, just like any other little people of that time, clustering around court and temple, ruled by the wisdom of the priest and led by the ambition of the king. But already, the reader may learn from the Bible, this new sort of man of which we speak, the prophet, was in evidence. As troubles thicken round the divided Hebrews, the importance of these prophets increases. What were these prophets? They were men of the most diverse origins. The prophet Ezekiel was of the priestly caste, and the prophet Amos wore the goatskin mantle of a shepherd. But all had this in common, that they gave allegiance to no one but to the God of righteousness, and that they spoke directly to the people. They came without license or consecration. 
Now the word of the Lord came unto me. That was the formula. They were intensely political. They exhorted the people against Egypt, that broken reed, or against Assyria or Babylon. They denounced the indolence of the priestly order or the flagrant sins of the king. Some of them turned their attention to what we should now call social reform. The rich were grinding the faces of the poor. The luxurious were consuming the children's bread. Wealthy people made friends with and imitated the splendors and vices of foreigners. And this was hateful to Jehovah, the God of Abraham, who would certainly punish this land. These fulminations were written down and preserved and studied. They went wherever the Jews went, and wherever they went, they spread a new religious spirit. They carried the common man past priest and temple, past court and king, and brought him face to face with the rule of righteousness. That is their supreme importance in the history of mankind. In the great utterances of Isaiah, the prophetic voice rises to a pitch of splendid anticipation and foreshadows the whole earth united and at peace under one God. Therein the Jewish prophecies culminate. All the prophets did not speak in this fashion, and the intelligent reader of the prophetic books will find much hate in them, much prejudice, and much that will remind him of the propaganda pamphlets of the present time. Nevertheless, it is the Hebrew prophets of the period round and about the Babylonian captivity, who mark the appearance of a new power in the world, the power of individual moral appeal, of an appeal to the free conscience of mankind, against the fetish sacrifices and slavish loyalties that had hitherto bridled and harnessed our race. Chapter 23. The Greeks. Now, while after Solomon, whose reign was probably about 960 BC, the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah were suffering destruction and deportation, and while the Jewish people were developing their tradition in captivity in Babylon, another great power over the human mind, the Greek tradition, was also arising. While the Hebrew prophets were working out a new sense of direct moral responsibility between the people and an eternal and universal God of right, the Greek philosophers were training the human mind in a new method and spirit of intellectual adventure. The Greek tribes, as we have told, were a branch of the Aryan-speaking stem, they had come down among the Aegean cities and islands some centuries before 1000 BC. They were probably already in southward movement before the pharaoh Thutmose hunted his first elephants beyond the conquered Euphrates, for in those days there were elephants in Mesopotamia and lions in Greece. It is possible that it was a Greek raid that burnt Knossos, but there are no Greek legends of such a victory, though there are stories of Minos and his palace, the labyrinth, and of the skill of the Cretan artificers. Like most of the Aryans, these Greeks had singers and reciters whose performances were an important social link and these handed down from the barbaric beginnings of their people two great epics, the Iliad, telling how a league of Greek tribes besieged and took and sacked the town of Troy in Asia Minor, and the Odyssey, 
being a long adventure story of the return of the sage Captain Odysseus from Troy to his own island. These epics were written down somewhere in the 8th or 7th century BC, when the Greeks had acquired the use of an alphabet from their more civilized neighbors. But they are supposed to have been in existence very much earlier. Formerly, they were ascribed to a particular blind bard, Homer, who was supposed to have sat down and composed them, as Milton composed Paradise Lost. Whether there really was such a poet, whether he composed or only wrote down and polished these epics, and so forth, is a favorite quarreling ground for the erudite. We need not concern ourselves with such bickerings here. The thing that matters from our point of view is that the Greeks were in possession of their epics in the 8th century BC, and that they were a common possession and a link between their various tribes, giving them a sense of fellowship as against the outer barbarians. They were a group of kindred peoples linked by the spoken and afterwards by the written word and sharing common ideals of courage and behavior. The epic showed the Greeks a barbaric people without iron, without writing, and still not living in cities. They seem to have lived at first in open villages of huts around the halls of their chiefs outside the ruins of the Aegean cities they had destroyed. Then they began to wall their cities and to adopt the idea of temples from the people they had conquered. It has been said that the cities of the primitive civilizations grew up about the altar of some tribal god and that the wall was added. In the cities of the Greeks, the wall preceded the temple. They began to trade and send out colonies. By the 7th century BC, a new series of cities had grown up in the valleys and islands of Greece, forgetful of the Aegean cities and civilization that had preceded them. Athens, Sparta, Corinth, Thebes, Samos, Miletus among the chief. There were already Greek settlements along the coast of the Black Sea and in Italy and Sicily. The heel and toe of Italy was called Magna Graecia. Marseille was a Greek town established on the site of an earlier Phoenician colony. Now countries which are great plains, or which have as a chief means of transport some great river, like the Euphrates or Nile, tend to become united under some common rule. The cities of Egypt and the cities of Sumeria, for example, ran together under one system of government. But the Greek peoples were cut up among islands and mountain valleys. Both Greece and Magna Graecia are very mountainous, and the tendency was all the other way. When the Greeks come into history, they are divided up into a number of little states, which show no signs of coalescence. They are different even in race. Some consist chiefly of citizens of this or that Greek tribe, Ionic, Aeolian, or Doric. Some have a mingled population of Greeks and descendants of the pre-Greek Mediterranean folk. Some have an unmixed free citizenship of Greeks, lording it over an enslaved conquered population like the Helots in Sparta. In some, the old leaderly Aryan families have become a close aristocracy. In some, there is a democracy of all the Aryan citizens. In some, there are elected or even hereditary kings. In some, usurpers or tyrants. 
and the same geographical conditions that kept the Greek states divided and various kept them small. The largest states were smaller than many English counties, and it is doubtful if the population of any of their cities ever exceeded a third of a million. Few came up even to 50,000. There were unions of interest and sympathy, but no coalescences. Cities made leagues and alliances as trade increased, and small cities put themselves under the protection of great ones. Yet all Greece was held together in a certain community of feeling by two things, by the epics and by the custom of taking part every fourth year in the athletic contests at Olympia. This did not prevent wars and feuds, but it mitigated something of the savagery of war between them, and a truce protected all travelers to and from the games. As time went on, the sentiment of a common heritage grew, and the number of states participating in the Olympic Games increased, until at last, not only Greeks, but competitors from the closely kindred countries of Epirus and Macedonia to the north were admitted. The Greek cities grew in trade and importance, and the quality of their civilization rose steadily in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. Their social life differed in many interesting points from the social life of the Aegean and River Valley civilizations. They had splendid temples, but the priesthood was not the great traditional body it was in the cities of the older world, the repository of all knowledge, the storehouse of ideas. They had leaders and noble families, but no quasi-divine monarch surrounded by an elaborately organized court. Rather, their organization was aristocratic, with leading families which kept each other in order. Even their so-called democracies were aristocratic. Every citizen had a share in public affairs and came to the assembly in a democracy, but everybody was not a citizen. The Greek democracies were not like our modern democracies in which everyone has a vote. Many of the Greek democracies had a few hundred or a few thousand citizens, and then many thousands of slaves, freedmen, and so forth, with no share in public affairs. Generally in Greece, affairs were in the hands of a community of substantial men. Their kings and their tyrants alike were just men set in front of other men, or usurping a leadership. They were not quasi-divine overmen, like Pharaoh or Minos, or the monarchs of Mesopotamia. Both thought and government, therefore, had a freedom under Greek conditions, such as they had known in none of the older civilizations. The Greeks had brought down into cities the individualism the personal initiative of the wandering life of the northern parklands. And we find that as they emerge from a condition of barbaric warfare, a new thing becomes apparent in their intellectual life. We find men who are not priests, seeking and recording knowledge, and inquiring into the mysteries of life and being in a way that has hitherto been the sublime privilege of priesthood or the presumptuous amusement of kings. We find already in the 6th century BC, perhaps while Isaiah was still prophesying in Babylon, such men as Thales and Anaximander of Miletus and Heraclitus of Ephesus, who were what we should now call independent gentlemen, giving their minds to shrewd questionings of the world in which we live, asking what its real nature was, 
whence it came and what its destiny might be, and refusing all ready-made or evasive answers. Of these questionings of the universe by the Greek mind, we shall have more to say a little later in this history. These Greek inquirers who begin to be remarkable in the 6th century BC are the first philosophers, the first wisdom lovers in the world. And it may be noted here how important a century this 6th century BC was in the history of humanity. For not only were these Greek philosophers beginning the research for clear ideas about this universe and man's place in it, and Isaiah carrying Jewish prophecy to its sublimest levels, but as we shall tell later, Gautama Buddha was then teaching in India, and Confucius and Lao Tzu in China, from Athens to the Pacific, the human mind was astir. And with that evocative ending to the chapter, I think we'll end this evening's reading from A Short History of the World by H.G. Wells. And yet again, I'm amazed by his ability to cram so much information into such a concise work. It's really a pleasure to read this, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you'd like to read this work for yourself and see the many photographs and drawings in it, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod or drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next Boring Book, good night. <laughs>